thank you so much uh, for coming out. I'm, it's just amazing to see people from Port Burwell, from Newman, from St. Mike's, from all kinds of work over many years. And you know, I have really nothing new to say that I have an artist. <laughs> oh, yes, you. I want to thank the, um, the Joint Ecological Ministry for inviting me. I want to thank Emory Jackson, the Jesuit Forum, all the organizers, uh, the Mary Ward Center, which has done really spectacular work over the past few years. And um, I actually got the Mary Ward Scholarship for Women in Religion when I was a very poor student at St. Mike's. So thank you all for coming and for this possibility of speaking with you this evening. I really appreciate it. And seeing so many friends, it's really lovely. I also know that many of us in this room have spent uh, much of our lives on ecological issues. And also I appreciate the collegial work over many years in what is a rather difficult journey to try to respond to the social and ecological issues of our era. The title, Flourishing of All Life, How Are We to Be a Prophetic Voice for Action on Climate Change? As you can imagine, there are different ways to approach this topic, and as you can imagine, I really don't have clear answers of how to be a prophetic voice, what is the best course of action, if and how we're going to mitigate or adapt to climate change. These are very difficult questions, so what I can offer are just some personal reflections. And as you know that climate change is one global planetary reality where we really don't know what's going to happen. But if, even if we were to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond to what's going on in human affairs, political instabilities, the decline of governance, the rise of fascism, the inequities, the human migrations, the media inundation. So these are difficult times, and I'm not going to dwell on those, but those are really what is going on around us, including climate change. I'm sure I share with many of you a very difficult tension, a deep appreciation for the natural world and a desperation about what is happening. I stand in awe of the natural world, evolution, the Cenozoic era, animal communities, the beauty and elegance of the natural world, the human sensibilities where we can actually see and feel and understand, and I am overwhelmed with despair about the ruin of these same animal communities, the pollution, the plastics in all the waterways, the integrity of the biosphere declining, and human ignorance and arrogance. So these tensions are, are quite difficult to ma manage, I'm sure they are for many of you as well. The ecological situation is dire, the future is worrisome, there is no hiding from these realities, and I would still say despair is not an option. It's not a worthy option. So I have three main points for our, for our discussion this evening, and we're going to take breaks in between, and I say this because I teach university, and you know that after five minutes, 50% of the group is no longer listening. <laughs> That's actually statistically true. <laughs> after eight minutes, 80% are not listening. I know, it's really sad. What is wrong with our young people today? <laughs> So the first theme, sorry, excuse me, I just would like you to all notice this, and I'm going to take it off, because I never got the hang of these things, so this was a Christmas gift from my daughter, so please acknowledge it, and I, can't, I can't think with it on. The first theme I'm calling a reckoning, which is a suitable religious term. I want to affirm the work on ecological issues that has happened over the past 20 years, and I want to affirm the work on climate change. <clears throat> the Council of Canadians, Polaris, the eco-justice work, all of the work in environmental law, the unbelievable work of religious congregations on carbon emissions, divesting fossil fuels, reforestation, water projects, green buildings, eco-justice workshops, <coughs> countless educational initiatives, community gardens, and all of the politicking that most of the religious sisters do, the justice, peace, integrity of creation work, the multi-religious collaboration. So much work is being done, from grassroots to federal politics, the international work, the work of CPJ, DNP, 
Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything. Tim LeDuc, who is not here tonight, I just want to say he wrote a book on climate change before Naomi Klein, very important book. All the university programs, Steve Dunn, um, Stephen Sharper who's here, Dennis O'Hara, these programs are up and running. The Canadian Environmental Network publishes events daily of going on across the country. In Toronto, you've got this greenspiration.org. How many of you go on this website, greenspiration.org? It's incredible what's going on in, in Toronto. The activism, 360.org. The connecting with social movements, with Standing Rock and Idle No More, Black Lives Matter and Me Too. The supporting of indigenous initiatives, the stimulating of democracy. If you think there are food, our clothing, transportation, energy, <laughs> fair trade, all of these daily parts of our lives are being renegotiated. So I want to affirm that this is ongoing, these cultural transitions. I'm not saying they're deep, and I'm not saying they're pervasive, <clears throat> but they are real shifts. Thomas Homer Dixon talks about four transitions, a cognitive transition, economic, political, and normative. And I would say many of us here would say there's a spiritual transition going on as well. These are non-linear transformations, the great transformations, Thomas Berry talked about the great work, David Corton, the great turning, People talk about a new axial age, Vandana Shiva talks about an era of earth democracy. So I just want to say this is quite extraordinary for those of us who were doing this work 20 years ago and scrambling to get heard. We were voices in the wilderness, there were very few resources, few people, very little public traction, in a sea of climate change deniers. So I just want to take stock right now, reckoning of this sea change that is occurring. So there are prophetic voices, and there have been prophetic voices, and we are in a new moment where these topics are in the public domain, and in countless different ways, from plant preservation to political sovereignty, from spirituality to <clears throat> military preparedness, which is not something I would I'm actually saying is a good thing, but military preparedness in the face of climate change is going on all over the world. So ec ecological concerns are infiltrating most disciplines, most progressive organizations, most political debates, and most religious traditions. So to me that's a reckoning. Things are happening. And I want to talk in my first first segment about a theme that is really <coughs> popular in the religious communities and that is of eco-justice. And I just want to raise some questions around this theme of eco-justice or earth justice. So this is my experience, is that it's, po it's a popular term and we throw it around somewhat loosely, but in fact what do we mean when we say these terms, eco-justice or earth justice? I think they're quite easy to say, but what they mean is not as transparent. So justice as a principle, if we say it's a principle, it's usually based on inherent rights. <clears throat> Human dignity, the right to live, autonomy. Humans can't be seen as a means to an end, they have intrinsic value. The earth can't be seen as a means to an end, it has intrinsic value. These are some ways we talk about it. With the term justice comes moral obligations. And then there's a whole other conversation, is justice deserved? Is it a right, or is it something that we actually have to merit? Excuse me. <clears throat> we talk about justice being impartial or blind. But if we were to step back to, and to say, what institutions promote and protect justice today? What institutions promote and protect any kind of understanding of eco-justice? I know many of you have done international work, and you know that justice cannot be imposed. It, it can't supersede sovereignty. So many, many people who've tried to do social justice work in different parts of the world can come up against sovereignty issues. especially when it's human rights, and often when it's rights for women. When we, when we, meaning 
generally speaking, those in the ecological communities, when we say justice, we usually mean equality or equity or fairness, <laughs> equal access to resources, equal sharing of the burdens and responsibilities. So this is the NGOs, the progressive Christian communities, the political left, who call for justice, and they call for eco-justice. But what exactly are we asking for? Because if we're actually saying we want a fair distribution of resources, a fair access to resources, we want a kind of distributive justice or redistributive justice. But if we actually are saying we want a redistribution of wealth, even economist Amartya Sen would say this is not going to happen. There's not going to be that kind of justice. He talks about the human capabilities theory of ways and means for people to develop their capabilities and live with dignity. So sometimes I think we have a very naive usage of the term eco-justice when we talk about equity and sharing of resources in some kind of sameness. So can we add to our conversation about that eco-justice includes a sharing of power, a sharing of political access, because I think that's got a bit more traction. We also want retributive justice, meaning we want punishment for crimes. <coughs> People must pay when they cause suffering. So activists and wildlife rangers and indigenous leaders are dying at the rate of four a week assassinations for a week in 24 countries and this is a growing sense around the world that anyone can kill an environmental defender with impunity and most of these environmental defenders are women and there were twice as many deaths in 2016 and 17 as 2015 so environmental activists are now greatly threatened they're threatened with arrests, death threats, sexual assaults, surveillance, and illegal attacks. And this is an organization called Global Witness that the Guardian Weekly will publish this, but Global Witness is paying attention to this. So when we're talking about eco-justice, it's very important to think about environmental defenders, what they're doing, where they are, what risks. We talk about ecological injustices. But in that conversation, rarely do we include the trapping and killing of animals, overfishing, overfishing, poisoning <laughs> waterways, habitat loss, deforestation, <clears throat> species extinction. Now, are these injustices? We can talk about restorative justice, that there must be some reparation for crimes. We must restore. But how is this possible in an era of species extinction? What could that possibly mean? When we use the language of justice for the earth, for the earth community, it's a question, what are we asking for here? Do we want rights, environmental rights? Does the earth have rights? If so, what kinds of rights? In the olden days, we couldn't talk about rights without talking about responsibilities and obligations. <coughs> so then what are our responsibilities to the rights of the earth? Do animals have rights? Do they have full rights? Many of you will know about the Great Ape Project, giving primates human rights. Currently, there's an interesting initiatives in New Zealand, Ecuador, Colorado, and India to give <coughs> rivers the status of a person so they can have human rights. What are our responsibilities to this language of justice and rights? Is it a crime, what we're doing to the earth? What is a just relationship we can have with the natural world? How much can we take before it's unjust? What is our moral relationship for climate change? So that's the, this is the theme I just want to take a short conversation about, of what do we mean when we use these terms, in my view, somewhat loosely, around eco-justice or justice for the earth. So the way this will go is you talk to, well, you can talk to whoever you like, the people beside you, and if you want to move, but it'll only go for about five minutes. So it's just a short buzz session. So, and if you have nothing to say, we'll move on. But you've got five minutes or so to chit-chat if you would like.